Wow, what a week. The Lord's been good. Amen. Amen. Let's gather now. A song came to me that I used to sing years and years ago, but it's so appropriate for what we're going through right now. Um, it's called Meet Us Here. It's easy to learn. I'll sing it a few times through and let's just make it a, a corporate song, a, a praised crying out to the Lord. So Lord, we have come to this house where we love to sing your praises. We lift our hearts and our hands to the King of all the ages. Hear us, Lord, we pray. Come, Jesus, come. Come fill this place. Meet us here. Meet us here, Lord. We are few, but we are strong when you surround us. Meet us here, meet us here, Lord, as we gather in your name, meet us here. Isn't that a great song? Let's try it again. Lord, we have come to this house where we love to sing your praises we lift our hearts and our hands to the king of all the ages hear us lord we pray come jesus come Come fill this place. Meet us here. Meet us here, Lord. We are few, but we are strong when you surround us. Meet us here, meet us here, Lord, as we gather in your name, meet us here. Now that we know it, let's really sing it out and invite the Lord to come where we are in our homes this morning. Come on, here we go. Lord, we have come to this house where we love to sing your praises. We lift our hearts and our hands to the King of all the ages. Hear us, Lord, we pray. Come, Jesus, come, come fill this place. Meet us here, meet us here, Lord. We are few, but we are strong. When you surround us, meet us here, meet us here, Lord, as we gather in your name, meet us here, sing meet us here. Meet us here, meet 
Guide us here, Lord. We are few, but we are strong when you surround us. Meet us here. Meet us here, Lord. As we gather in your name, meet us here. And as we worship in your name, and as we worship in your name, Lead us here. Who am I that the highest King would welcome me? I was lost, but He brought me. Oh, His love for me. Yes, his love for me, who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. Free at last, he has ransomed me. His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Who the Son sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes I am. In my Father's house, in my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes I am. And I'm chosen. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am who you say I am. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am in my father's house. There's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am saying I am chosen and not forsaken. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am who you say I am. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. 
I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. And in my Father's house, in my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. You are beautiful beyond description to marvelous for words to wonderful for comprehension like nothing ever seen or heard who could grasp your infinite wisdom who can fathom the depths of your love you are beautiful beyond description majesty enthroned above and i stand i stand in awe of you i stand I stand in awe of you, holy God, to whom all praise is due. I stand in awe of you. Express yourself to the Lord. Use your hands, not, not only your voice. Stand before him in awe. You are beautiful beyond description and to marvelous for words, to marvelous for words. You're so wonderful, Lord. For wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard. Who can grasp your infinite wisdom? Who can fathom the depths of your love? You are beautiful beyond description. Majesty enthroned above. stand in awe of you. I stand, I stand in awe of you. Holy God, to whom all praise is due, I stand in awe of you. stand in awe of you. We stand, we stand in awe of you. Holy God, to whom all praise is due, we stand in awe of you. Holy God, to praises do we stand in awe of you Amen. 
Hey, good morning. Thanks for being here with us today. Wow, uh, we sure do have a lot going on, at least out here in California. 2020 just keeps on sending all kinds of challenges. Now we can add uh, fires and internet outages and a heat wave to the list of plagues of 2020. Anyway, I hope you're doing okay. Um, but listen, you know, it's okay too to just fall apart sometimes. I, he I heard someone say, uh, every time I go uh, and get a big burrito from our little local restaurant, Mi Casita, it falls apart and I don't love it any less. So feel free sometimes. Uh, we love you. Uh, we're in this together. We know uh, that it's a difficult time. So let us know if we can help you with anything. Hey, uh, just to keep things interesting and rolling along, today we are going to go ahead and talk about racial reconciliation. <laughs> Um, today's sermon is a sermon I've, I've needed to preach for a few weeks now, and I haven't just postponed it because I'm a chicken. Uh, that's one reason, um, but I've held off because this was such a hot button, even just a few weeks ago, that I'm not sure the scriptures would have been heard over the news cycle. You know what I mean? Um, besides, uh, Carol and I are heading out tomorrow uh, on our 24th wedding, for our 24th wedding anniversary, and we're leaving over, going over to the coast, and I won't have cell coverage. So I thought, man, this is a great Sunday to preach on this. Um, now, I, I'm going to treat this sensitively, because I know, I know there, are, there are a lot of ideas on this. Uh, depending on your background, you'll see things differently. And I want to be on the journey with you. I don't have all the answers. And sometimes I kind of hesitate to speak if I just don't feel like I know everything. But I feel like this is important enough, and, and I, I do not think that the church should ignore it. I know some of you might argue that this is a political issue, and Paul, you should just stay out of it. Um, but as you'll see today, I think Jesus addresses ra racial reconciliation far more than a lot of other topics that we're concerned with, uh, far more than abortion, far more than homosexuality. This is a deeply spiritual issue. Um, in fact, Jesus, you'll see, I think you'll see it today, he was kind of a pot stirrer on this. And, and although he is a big source of courage for me to speak boldly today, I'm not just trying to stir the pot. I, I'm really trying to help us think through this Christianly, to, have a, uh, to just have a biblical perspective. So, to start us off today, we're going to go back to some old friends of ours. Uh, you remember a couple of weeks ago I told you about the Assyrians and the story of Jonah. Um, the Assyrians were a pretty rough crowd. Remember I told you they were really skilled warriors. They were incredibly brutal. Remember the skinning people alive and the big stacks of heads. Um, I briefly mentioned that there was a point when Assyria set their sights on Israel and actually sent their army in to conquer the northern kingdom of Israel. Uh, the northern kingdom had its capital in a little hilltop city uh, called Samaria. It's about 75 miles north of Jerusalem. Um, so in 722, the Assyrians send their army and totally demolished the northern kingdom. And as I told you when we were talking about Jonah, Assyria took people captives. So 2 Kings 17, 6, you don't have to turn there, says in the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria and he carried the Israelites away to Assyria. So the Assyrians didn't take everyone, but huge portions of the population were deported to Assyria. So it left Samaria, the capital city, pretty much empty, except for just a, just a few remaining Jews. Um, then the king of Assyria did something kind of interesting. I don't know exactly why they did this, uh, but 2 Kings 17.24 says the, the king of Assyria brought people then from Babylon and from Kutha and Ava and Hamath, Sepharvaim, and he put them into the cities of Samaria to replace the people of Israel. Uh, so the Assyrians brought these new people in to live in the evacuated cities of Samaria. So as you can imagine, uh, these new people from Babylon and all these other places, as they come, they bring their culture with them. They bring their traditions and their gods and their forms of worship. And the few Jews who still remained there eventually just started to blend in with these new inhabitants. They, they start to take on this new identity. They intermarry. Uh, they slowly start to worship new gods alongside the God of Israel. So there's this like blending of cultures and religions in Samaria. And so this is what we read in 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 33. It's such a weird picture. It says, So they feared the Lord, 
but they also served their own gods after the manner of the nations from among whom they'd been carried away. So these nations feared the Lord, in verse 31, and also served their carved images. Their children did likewise, and their children's children, as their fathers did, so they do to this day. So this group of people, as they intermarry and adopt this new culture, were in some sense Jewish, and they worshipped Yahweh. But in a lot of other ways, they were like totally pagan. So they become known, because they're from the region of Samaria, as the Samaritans. You've probably heard of the Samaritans. There are a lot of references in the Gospels to the Samaritans. And as you probably know, there's this very strong like, clash of culture and race that occurs when the Samaritans and the Jews get together. The, the full-blooded monotheistic Jews just detested and uh, just hated the mixed marriages, the mixed worship of their northern neighbors. The Jews did not see the Samaritans as being authentic followers of the one true God and vice versa. Um, in fact, the Samaritans um, build their own temple. Matt referred to this a couple of weeks ago on Mount Gerizim, which they insisted was the place that God's people should worship. The Jews, of course, insisted that it was the temple in Jerusalem that was the only place to really worship, truly worship God. So these, these walls, you can just imagine this, walls of bitterness were built between both sides and it erupted in this violence and these clashes over the next 550 or so years, this deep hatred grew between the Jews and the Samaritans. And then Jesus comes onto the scene. Like he was born right into the middle of this racial and religious cluster of hatred and volatility. And anyone with any good political sense would not have touched that tension with a 10-foot pole, right? Uh, but Jesus, as we know, was not anyone. And over and over, he's going to dive in. He preaches in Samaritan villages. He speaks to a Samaritan woman at the well. A couple of weeks ago, it was, the, it was a Samaritan who returned to thank Jesus. And the gospel writer makes a point of bringing that out. At one point, Jesus is accused of being a Samaritan and having a demon. It was this, this kind of vulgar insult. Jesus didn't want to dismiss this issue as something for the politicians to sort out. He dove in. He saw racial reconciliation as a deeply spiritual issue. So we're going to look at, I think, one of the most famous references to a Samaritan in the Bible. And, and there's this hidden power in this story that is not obvious to us as 21st century readers. Because we don't have the context of a first century reader like I just tried to give you. We can't feel the animosity. When we hear Jew and Samaritan, we don't sense any tension so what we do then is we tend to domesticate the story. The parable of the Good Samaritan, which is what we're looking at, has become a simple story just about helping people in need. But I'm going to ruin that for you today. This is one of the most provocative stories that Jesus tells. So if you have your Bibles, why don't you go ahead and open up to Luke chapter 10, verse 25. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what's written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says to him, you have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. So stop there for just a sec. This guy wants to put Jesus to the test, asks him about eternal life. And Jesus responds like he does a lot with a question of his own. Well, what do you think? And I think he does that because sometimes we know the right answer. People know the right answer. But he, he wants the lawyer to take the head knowledge and give it some legs. Right? So he says, what do you think? The dude answers. He says, yeah, I love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Uh, love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, right on, man. All the law, all the prophets are sitting on those two things. You've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. So before we get, it, we get even started on this today, number one on your outline, I just want to remind you of this. You know it already. Love is an action. Love is a verb. Love is something you do. Saying that you love someone doesn't really carry any weight 
in the scriptures. Not only do you have to know the right answer, but you have to do the right answer. You not only have to feel the love, you have to show the love. Uh, if you're around last summer, our theme for the year was justice and mercy. And our verse was Micah 6, 8. He has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice? Love mercy. Walk humbly with your God. Do justice means it has to happen, not just be thought about. Right? Everyone here, I think, would probably say that we love our black brothers and sisters in Christ. Someone asked me, they're like, do you, do you think that the people in your church are racist? And I, I didn't hesitate. I said, no, I, I don't think there are racist people in our church. So then, uh, a little while later, somebody else asked me a question. So what is your church then doing about racial injustice? I said, I, honestly, I think we're just trying to wrap our heads around the problem. And then she said, and you, maybe you've heard this. She says, well, it isn't enough for the church to not be racist. At this moment in history, the church needs to be anti-racist. What she's saying is that it was not enough for us to love people of color if we weren't going to do anything about it. Love is a, is a verb. We're about to see that the lawyer may have the vertical dimension down, like love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Think about the vertical beam of the cross. Maybe the lawyer does okay with his love for the Lord, but there is also this necessary horizontal beam that is more difficult. Love your neighbor as yourself. And this is what Jesus is going to camp out on. Both the vertical and the horizontal beams are necessary for the cross. If you just have the vertical beam, you just have, I don't know, like a, like a stick, you know. Uh, so love your neighbor as yourself. An easy way maybe to think about this is to ask yourself the question, like if I were in their shoes, how would I want people to love me? How would I want to be loved? Listen, without loving your neighbor as yourself, you do not have a complete cross. So therefore, we do not have a complete gospel. I told you I was reading this book by John Perkins called One Blood, Parting Words to the Church. And uh, he says at one point, he says, the problem with the gospel is that there is a gaping hole. We have preached a gospel that leaves us believing that we can be reconciled to God but not be reconciled to our Christian brothers and sisters who don't look like us. I'll just say it bluntly. Number two on your outline. You cannot love God if you do not love people as you love yourself. It's just a scriptural truth. 1 John 4, 20, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's, he's a liar, that's what scripture say. For he, do, he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. If we miss this, man, we miss the gospel. In some places in the scriptures, it's almost as if loving God is done like through loving your neighbor. That's the way we love God. We may have the vertical beam. We may love God. But if we shut down when it comes to people, we're missing out. We're missing it. So the lawyer continues, pick up in verse 29. But he, uh, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? This is, this is the question. Who is my neighbor that Jesus is going to answer? So Jesus replies, oh, and he tells the story. A man was going from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him, beat him, departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed on the other side. I'm going to stop there for just a second. Um, let me show you something. You may have heard this before. What's the third thing I'm going to say? So, for example, when I say Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Larry, Mo, and good, you're doing good. I can hear you from here. The good, the bad, and the ugly, good. Two things that evoke a third. So, let me try this one on you. Um, uh, a priest, a Levite, and a yeah, we don't, we don't have a context for that. But historians tell us that saying a priest and a Levite in front of a first century Jewish audience would have evoked a third, an Israelite. Ezra chapter 10, verse 5, the leading priest, Levite, and Israelites. Nehemiah eleven three. in the towns of Judah, all lived on their property in their towns, the priests, the Levites, and the 
Israelites. So there was this expectation that the first century Jewish audience would have had of what Jesus was going to say next. Oh, a priest walked by. Oh, a Levite walked by. Well, then at least a good Jewish person, a good Israelite would have stopped to help. Um, But if you know the parable, you know that's not the story that Jesus tells. Uh, One commentator wrote, he said, Jesus is telling a parable and parables never go the way you expect. Uh, Instead of the anticipated Israelite, the person who stops to help is a Samaritan. He says, in modern terms, it would have been like going from Larry and Mo to Osama bin Laden, which probably would have sounded like an overstatement to us if we just hadn't spent all that time looking at 550 years of animosity and hatred between Jews and Samaritans. See, because Jesus isn't interested in coming into this story and just meeting our expectations so he can keep us comfortable. He he wasn't there as a politician to say what we wanted to hear. Honestly, I don't think we would have even liked Jesus if he came into our church on Sunday because we don't like to be challenged like that. I don't. It's just awkward. But number three, Jesus came in to interrupt the status quo. He, he comes in, he wants to shake us loose. He wants to redefine our entire view of the world, our worldview. He could have told the story with a Samaritan victim and a Jewish helper. That's the way they would have expected it, but he reverses the whole thing. You know, as I wrote this sermon, I, I thought, man, a, a sermon on racial injustice right now, after everything that's going on with all the strong opinions just flying, it's going to make people uncomfortable. And then I got to this point, and I thought, well, at least I'm in good company. Jesus, he insisted that people be uncomfortable because otherwise it means that we're stuck. And I I don't want to be stuck. So when all this stuff started, we started seeing the news cycles, I made a deliberate decision to challenge myself to simply listen to what people were saying. Not just my people, But my black brothers and sisters in faith, pastors, speakers at Christian conferences, these these weren't just YouTube personalities or rioters or instigators. These were solid, long-time Christian men and women who I had previously looked up to and listened to. People that had the same theological training, more theological training than I've had. And I'll tell you what, man. When I actually stopped to listen, I heard things that I simply never knew. I heard that my experience as a white American is not the same experience of black Americans. I have my own experiences in this world. I have experiences with law enforcement. I have experiences with employment, with community, with where I live, with how I live. And I just kind of naturally thought that's why everybody else's experience was basically the same, you know? But that's just, that's not true. If you're struggling with this, I want to challenge you, man. Go listen to... T.D. Jakes or Vody Bauckham or Albert Tate or John Gray, just, just hear him out. Just listen to him talk. And it'll probably be upsetting because it'll sound different from what you're used to hearing. That's because the vast majority of our lives is spent in these echo chambers where we can be comfortable. We hear from people like us. I hear from people who have the same experience in life as I do. And I like listening to those people because it's easier And it doesn't have to disrupt my tranquil little perspective on our world. I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but Jesus never intended for us to be comfortable. He was deeply divisive because he came to draw a line between the things of God and the things of man. And he says, you cannot sit on the fence. So the hero of this story is not going to be an Israelite. It's going to be a despised and hated Samaritan. Okay, verse 33. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? 
He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said, you go and do likewise. Uh, you know the story, but remember the question Jesus is answering. Who's my neighbor? Who proved to be the neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? It was the one who showed him mercy. It was the Samaritan. Interestingly, the Samaritan is not the one who needs the help. He is the one who is other. He's the one who's different. That's your neighbor. And with that, man, Jesus just tosses a grenade. Not like, oh, I didn't see that coming. That's a cool twist. If you're really understanding what I'm saying here, you'd say, man, that's like, that's almost offensive. Because he's coming in and he's dismantling some of these deep-set cultural mindsets. To a first century Jew, there was no such thing as a good Samaritan. That makes no more sense than like a good murderer or a good terrorist. Especially today, this should challenge us and be deeply provocative. This isn't just a story about how to love your neighbor. Oh, make sure you bind his wounds and put him on a donkey. Think about what the question that Jesus is answering is. What, is. what does the lawyer ask? Who is my neighbor? In other words, whom should I love as myself? Jesus' answer is going to be really clear. Number four, your neighbor is anyone who bears the image of God. Samaritans, Jews, black people, Asian people, Caucasian people, unborn people, every human being on the planet. We are all image bearers, regardless of theology, regardless of skin color, religion, politics, every man, woman, child of every nation and every culture. It is not limited to people who live like us, who look like us, and who vote like us. Because when Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan, he has the end in mind. The end is Revelation chapter 7. It's a beautiful picture. After this, I looked, John says, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, all tribes, all peoples, all languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. You notice there are no donkeys and no elephants, but everyone is worshiping the lamb. And we, in a lot of ways, we look forward to that picture. We picture that day when we're worshiping around the throne and there's this great range of diversity in heaven from people all over the world and we're eager for that. In fact, I, I think we're often more eager for that, to stand around the throne in the future, than we are to sit at a table here and now and just listen to people who are different from us as brothers and sisters in Christ. We want to experience that in heaven, but we don't have any interest in experiencing that now. But Jesus is trying to get that future day, man, just to overflow into this day. May your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So that means we make every possible effort to come to the table with people who have had a different experience with this life than we have had and just to listen to them. Who's your neighbor? The one who showed mercy. So go, do likewise, regardless of whether we think they deserve it uh, when, we, when we were talking about justice and mercy last summer, I used that quote from Woodrow Kroll. He said, justice is for those who deserve it, and mercy is for those who don't. Let that sink in for a second. The one who showed mercy, you, go and do likewise. Our inability to, first of all, just see each other as siblings, our brothers and sisters, but then to empathize and to share some of that pain a little bit. I know for most of us living in white America, man, it's hard to see that there's a racial problem because we just don't live in that space. And when we're told there's a problem, it seems like we come up with all sorts of ways to dismiss it, you know, just to say, oh, it's not really my problem. But Galatians 6, 2, you know, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We say, well, that's not my burden. Why should I have to bear that? Why should I have to carry that load with my brothers and sisters? So you know what we don't do? We don't speak up. We don't act because it means we're going to take on some of the load. And, and we send a message to our siblings. You're not really worth it. I, I have something more important 
to be doing with my time than getting involved with your problems. Uh, John Perkins, I'll read this quote to you. and We'll kind of wrap it up with this and let him do the close here. He says, as I come closer to the end of my journey, I am aware that community development will only take us so far because this is a gospel issue. The problem of reconciliation in our country and in our churches is much too big to be wrestled to the ground by plans that begin in the minds of men. He says this is a God-sized problem. This can't be fixed by the black church or the white church. It must be the reconciled church. Black and white Christians working together to image Christ to the world. There is no institution on earth more equipped or more capable of bringing transformation to the cause of reconciliation than the church. Justice, diversity, and reconciliation are not extra add-ons that the church can opt out of as a matter of personal preference. They are an essential part of the gospel. We have only to look at the signs of the times to realize that the church may not have long to get this right. We may not have much time left to offer the world a glimpse of the unity that will point the eyes of the watching world to the power of our great God. Amen? Yes, there is an urgency. Time is running out for all of us. But while we still have time, let's reflect the heart of Jesus who prayed earnestly that his church might one day be one. Let me let that sink in and speak for itself. I put it on your sermon notes if you're interested in looking at that book, John Perkins' One Blood. So when Jesus uh, goes into the upper room in John chapter 17, Uh, He prays a prayer. It's called the High Priestly Prayer. And one of the parts of the prayer, you may know this. He says, The glory that you have given me, I have given to them. That's speaking to God the Father, has given to the Son. The glory that you have given to me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me, and you love them, even as you have loved me. And so my prayer uh, today that I want to close with is just a prayer of unity, a prayer that we would be brought together because of the love of Jesus Christ. And so let's go ahead and bow our heads and we'll, we'll close out today in a word of prayer. Um, God, I, I just love the, the prayer that we would be one because you knew this would be a struggle for us. You knew there would be times when we tended to be divided and to go our separate ways, God, but you have called us into the perfect unity that you have with the Father You have said, I pray that for my church, for my people to be one, just as we are one. So God, I I pray right now over the church. I pray for a spirit of humility and reconciliation. I pray over a spirit of of being desirous of of bearing one one another's burdens, that we we would look forward to the opportunity when we can help carry the load for our brothers and sisters in Christ. So God, we are looking forward to that day, that future day, when we stand around the throne and we worship with every tribe, every tongue, every nation. So God, help that future day to overflow into today, that we would seek to come together and be unified with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you for this time together. We love you. We pray this through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.